me up and Michael called me and told me what was going on and said, hey man, this, this is huge, just a little bit more than I was uh, uh, planning on getting into it. I would love to have you be a part of it. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't anything I had to think about. This is what I live for. This is what I dedicated to giving my life to. I like to tell people yeah. uh, when, I, when I meet them, I, I tell them that I've accomplished a lot. I, I'm grateful for what I've been uh, blessed to accomplish. Uh, and I, I'm honest, the first half of my life was about me. Uh, it was about what I could do, what I could accomplish, what I could buy, where I could go, what I could do. And then there was at some point where a light went on. And, 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 and the message to me when that light went on was, Rick, it's not about you. Uh -huh. And from that point, it stopped being about me and it started being about me building my legacy. Yeah. That thing that I will leave behind, that 50 years after I'm gone, people will know I was here. All right. So it became about me making my presence felt. Not in me getting pats on the back, not in me getting uh, acknowledgments because of the accolades that I've uh, accomplished, but because I did something that changed the world that I was brought into. I left it a little bit better than when I found it. And that's something that I'm going to share with you. And then I'm going to hit a couple of disclaimers and I'm going to move into what I want to talk about. I was reared by my great grandfather and my great grandmother. Uh, so I had that old fashioned upbringing. I swear I was in church six days a week. Uh -huh. Not exaggerating. Monday was Hershey Board meeting, Tuesday was teachers meeting, Wednesday was Mission and Brotherhood, Thursday was uh, quite, uh, adult choir practice. My grandfather was the custodian, so he had to open the church. Friday was the day off. Saturday was youth choir house. Sunday was Sunday school. 11 o'clock service, 3 o'clock service, and BTE. Come on. That's what I did until I got old enough to say, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I, I gotta figure something out. But, but what it did is, it put me in front of people who had a consistency about what they were committed to. And that consistent, and I'm a firm believer that what, when you're consistent with what you're committed to, it creates consistent results. And you see the consistency in their life. And it was something my grandfather told me. Uh, I think I was 17 years old, came home uh, from school or football practice or something. And he's always sitting on the porch like he retired. I was getting ready to go in and he said, sit down, boy. Three ladies. Guess what? We only make up 13% of this country's population. But our young black men make up 50 to 51% of the prison population. What's different between you and them? Nothing. They set you up for the old you know, you thought it was cool and you took it. You think everything is about fun. I sit up and I watch this. This is what I deal with all the time. While y'all are out on your phones playing games, they have their kids at gun ranges. Preparing. They see you at the beginning. And they're prepared to engage you in any way. While they're training tactically, for anything that happens, we're driving by spraying our own community and hitting nothing but innocent children. They're preparing to hit what they shoot at. Academically, we get whatever is left over. You, you have access to the internet. You have access to information in the world you didn't have access to. What we didn't have access to growing up. We had to get up and actually go to the library. We had to get up and actually go down to the courthouse and pull up court documents. All that stuff is available now around. Anything that you want to know about yourself, about your history, about this country, about Africa, about why you should think highly of yourself and be prepared to do more than what you're doing, it's out there. But you rather play it. Everything is about the game. There's nothing wrong with being a young boy and having fun.
what I'm saying is the mindset has to be ownership. Why? Because you cannot compete in this capitalist world without owning something. The very definition of capitalism is to own resources, own property, own business, and then use other people's labor to enrich yourself. If you are not working to fulfill your own dream, if you're not grinding to fulfill your own dream, if you're not busting your butt to fulfill your own dream, you're busting your butt to fulfill someone else. That's the only two places in this world. You either, you either chase your vision or you beckon to somebody to fulfill their vision. The only difference between you and them is they decided to get out of their house. They weren't afraid to fail. They got out there. And I'm going to tell you, the only way you succeed is through failure. The whole lie about, you know, I don't fail. No. You fail to succeed. The only way that you succeed is by failure. If you're afraid to fail, you will never succeed. Michael Jordan, arguably, arguably the greatest player that's ever played basketball. You gotta do fill up your brain. Fill up your brain with, with what? Knowledge. With knowledge. What kind of knowledge? What was that? Man. You said math. Common sense. All type of knowledge like science, mathematics, things like that. Common sense. Math. Math. Get off the streets, go to college, go to high school, get education. But you know what? Y'all laughing, but that's serious though. I understand we want to laugh, have a good time, but it's, it's truth in what he's saying. It's changing our whole direction. It's self-love, dealing with each other on that kind of level. Because we keep going like we're going, we're going to they, they, they extinct people. You know what I mean when I say that? We're not going to be here no more. That we in prison, we're killing each other to get strikes in the hood because we've been taught to be this way. So we're here to let you know that it's been a lie this whole time. Don't fall for the lie. I wish I was 8, 9, 10, 15 years old and knew everything that I know now because it's been a whole different course. But now that I do know, it's time for y'all to learn that too. And keep it going. Who in here wants to ha have their own business? Wow, look at that. Look at that. All of y'all. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. something that's part of your intellect, it's part of your obtained knowledge. In other words, you talk with a different vernacular than white children. They came up in a different culture. How you talk and how they talk is totally different, but the test is based on how they talk. So guess what? They're going to score higher. But that's not an intelligence. That's not their intelligence. That's what they've learned. But that's what they use to always put out these studies to say that white students test 15 to 20 points higher on IQ tests on average. That's because y'all full of bull. When you put us down, we're highly creative. We figure, think of some of the things we figure out how to get in the hood with no money. We're very creative. We're very innovative. Think of, if you go back, just do a research. When you get off, do an internet research on all things invented and created by blacks. About half the things that they take credit for, we did. We are not dumb. We're not stupid. We need to stop believing it. There was a guy who wrote a book called Brainwash named Tom Burrell. He spent 30 something years in the marketing and advertising world. He started his own company, Black Guy. And what he learned is how they're using propaganda channels. Another good book on propaganda is a book called Propaganda by Edward Bernays, who is actually the guy who created the campaign that got white women smoking. They weren't smoking before this campaign, but he told them it was cool, it was fly, it was sexy and did that through the radio and the TV. That is how powerful this is. Half the things that people are doing that they think this is what I love to do and want to do, no, that's what you do to know who you love to do and want to do. If you don't know who you are, if you don't develop a positive self-image of who you are yourself, you will find yourself being led by what others believe about you or want you to believe about yourself. And so now we get back into that. So, one way that you manage that is manage what you intake. The only way that you stop the propaganda machine, the only way that you stop it is to monitor what you allow to come into your gates, your eyes and your ears. If you allow anything to come in, anything has an impact. 
if you if everything you see is about uh, clapping, popping, whatever, whatever the latest term mm -hmm. for shooting a gun is this week, because mm -hmm. it's you know I remember it used to be wetting, it's been clapping, you know, popping a cap, banging, whatever it is that it is that tells you that's what we're supposed to be doing with each other. Put that crap down because that's purposely been put there to get us to kill one another. Because see, every time a black man takes the life of another black man, that's two black men that they don't have to worry about. The one that's dead and the one that's in prison. And they have found a way to continue slavery in prison. This is how. When slavery ended in 1865, they, they uh, started a process of in, uh, incarcerating, putting in prison, black men at a high rate. And then they started a program called convict leasing. In other words, that's what businesses came to the state and say, I will pay you $50 per man per day for them to come out and work on my railroad, for them to come out and dig my ditch, for them to come out and do it. That's why you see those old movies, those dudes on there, they, 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 they're doing the uh, railroad. Mm -hmm. Those are prisoners that private companies paid for to come out there and do work. It's, it's, called, it's called convict leasing back then. Well, it kept on going. It went on through what was called Jim Crow laws. The Jim Crow laws were laws that were put in place to make sure that the black men who had all the skills, because they were the slaves, they built the houses, they plowed the fields, they did it. They were the ones with the skills, so they would be the ones that would have been hired for the jobs. But they put in laws to make that make it very difficult to hire blacks over whites. And that started Jim Crow. This also started when you saw the Ku Klux Klan come in, and they started lynching brothers because they were intimidated and scared, and so black men was an issue with them. And so every chance they get, they were lynching. Went through that process, and then we got to mass incarceration in the late 70s, early 80s. Well, they started again. But this time, instead of convict leasing, the businessman got even more uh, savvy. <laughs> business savvy. Mm -hmm. on. He said, I'm not just going to hire, hire these cats from the prison. I'm going to go out and build prisons, and then I'm going to charge the state for them to house their prisoners. So now I'm getting paid to put, put them in the prison, then I'm using their labor for private businesses. So I'm profiting multiple ways off of this. And we only make up 13% of the population in this country. That means girls, boys, men, children, but our men make up 40% of the population in prison. We have the majority population in prison. That's not by accident. There are laws in place that make that happen now. fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.